Chapter Four of Aunt Jane's Nieces in the Red Cross by L. Frank Baum. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Four, The Hospital Ship. The energy of Doctor Geese was marvelous. He knew exactly what supplies would be needed to fit the Arabella thoroughly for her important mission, and with unlimited funds at his command to foot the bills. He quickly converted the handsome yacht into a model hospital ship Geese from the first developed a liking for Kelsey the mate whom he found a valuable assistant and the two came to understand each other perfectly Kelsey was a quiet man more thoughtful than experienced in medical matters But his common sense often guided him aright when his technical knowledge was at fault Captain Carg accepted the novel conditions thrust upon him without a word of protest he might secretly resent the uses to which his ship was being put but his young master's commands were law and his duty was to obey the same feeling prevailed among the other members of the crew all of whom were sangoans in three days jones and maud stanton returned from washington they were jubilant over their success we've secured everything we wanted the boy told uncle john Beth and Patsy with evident enthusiasm Not only have we the full sanction of the American Red Cross Society But I have letters to the different branches in the war zone asking for us every consideration Not only that but your senator proved himself a brick. What do you think? Here's a letter from our Secretary of State another from the French charge d'affaires half a dozen from prominent ambassadors of other countries We've a free field in all Europe practically that will enable us to work to the best advantage It's wonderful cried Patsy Mr. Merrick is so well known as a philanthropist that his name was a magic talisman for us said Maud Moreover our enterprise commands the sympathy of everyone. We had numerous offers of financial assistance, too. I Hope you didn't accept them said uncle John nervously no answered the boy i claim this expedition to be our private and individual property we can now do as we please being under no obligations to any but ourselves that's right said uncle john we don't want to be hampered by the necessity of advising with others by the way have you found a doctor yes a good one asked maud quickly highly recommended but homely as a rail fence continued patsy as her uncle hesitated that's nothing said ajo lightly nothing eh well wait till you see him she replied you'll never look dr geese in the face more than once i assure you after that you'll be glad to keep your eyes on his vest buttons i like him immensely though said beth he is clever honest and earnest the poor man can't help his mutilations which are the result of many unfortunate adventures Sounds like just the man we wanted declared Ajo and afterward he had no reason to recall that assertion a Week is a small time in which to equip a big ship But money and energy can accomplish much and the news from the seat of war was so eventful that they felt every moment to be precious And so they worked with feverish haste The tide of German success had turned and their great army from Paris to Vitry was now in full retreat fighting every inch of the way and leaving thousands of dead and wounded in its wake How long will it take us to reach Calais they asked captain Carg eagerly Eight or nine days said he We're not as fast as the big passenger steamers explained young Jones But with good weather the Arabella may be depended upon to make the trip in good shape and fair time on the 19th of September fully equipped and with her papers in order the beautiful yacht left her anchorage and began her voyage The weather proved exceptionally favorable During the voyage the girls busied themselves preparing their modest uniforms and Pumping dr. Geese for all sorts of information from scratches to amputations He gave them much practical and therefore valuable advice to guide them in whatever emergencies might arise and this was conveyed in the whimsical half humorous manner that seemed characteristic of him 
At first, Geese had shrunk involuntarily from facing this bevy of young girls, but they had so frankly ignored his physical blemishes and exhibited so true a comradeship to all concerned in the expedition that the doctor soon felt perfectly at ease in their society. During the evenings, he gave them practical demonstrations for the application of tourniquets, bandages, and the like, while Uncle John and Ajo by turns posed as wounded soldiers. Gies was extraordinarily deft in all his manipulations, and although Maud Stanton was a graduate nurse, with little experience, however, and Beth de Graff had studied the art for a year or more, it was Patsy Doyle who showed the most dexterity in assisting the doctor on these occasions. "'I don't know whether I'll faint at the sight of real blood,' she said. "'But I shall know pretty well what to do if I can keep my nerve.' The application of anaesthetics was another thing fully explained by Geese, but this could not be demonstrated. Patsy, however, was taught the use of the hypodermic needle, which Maud and Beth quite understood. We've a big stock of morphia in its various forms, said the doctor, and I expect it to prove of tremendous value in comforting our patients. I'm not sure I approve the use of that drug, remarked Uncle John. But think of the suffering we can allay by its use, exclaimed Maud. If ever morphia is justifiable, it is in war, where it can save many a life by conquering unendurable pain. I believe the discovery of morphine was the greatest blessing that humanity has ever enjoyed. Don't you, Dr. Geese? The one good eye of Geese had a queer way of twinkling when he was amused. It twinkled as the girl asked this question. Morphine, he replied, has destroyed more people than it has saved. You play with fire when you feed it to anyone under any circumstances. Nevertheless, I believe in its value on an expedition of this sort and that is why i loaded up on the stuff let me advise you never to tell a patient that we are administering morphine the result is all that he is concerned with and it is better he should not know what has relieved him on a sunny day when the sea was calm they slung a scaffold over the bow and painted a big red cross on either side of the white ship everyone aboard wore the red cross emblem on an armband even the sailors being so decorated. Uncle John was very proud of the insignia and loved to watch his girls moving around the deck in their sober uniforms and white caps. Jones endured the voyage splendidly and by this time had convinced himself that he was not again to be subject to the mal de mer of his first ocean trip. As they drew near to their destination, an atmosphere of subdued excitement pervaded the Arabella for even the sailors had caught the infection of the girl's eagerness and were anxious to get into action at the earliest moment it was now that uncle john began to busy himself with his especial prize a huge motor ambulance he had purchased in new york and which had been fully equipped for the requirements of war indeed an enterprising manufacturer had prepared it with the expectation that some of the belligerent governments would purchase it and Mr. Merrick considered himself fortunate in securing it. It would accommodate six seriously wounded on swinging beds and twelve others slightly wounded who might be able to sit upon cushioned seats. The motor was very powerful and the driver was protected from stray bullets by an armoured hood. In addition to this splendid machine, Mr. Merrick had secured a smaller ambulance that had not the advantage of the swinging beds, but could be rushed more swiftly to any desired location. Both ambulances were decorated on all sides with the emblem of the Red Cross, and would be invaluable in bringing the wounded to the Arabella. The ship carried a couple of small motor launches for connecting the shore with her anchorage. They had purposely brought no chauffeurs with them, as Uncle John believed foreign drivers, who were thoroughly acquainted with the country, would prove more useful than the American variety, and from experience he knew that a French chauffeur is the king of his profession. During the last days of the voyage, Mr. Merrick busied himself in carefully inspecting every detail of his precious vehicles, and explaining their operation to everyone on board. 
Even the girls would be able to run an ambulance on occasion, and the boy developed quite a mechanical talent in mastering the machines. I feel, said young Jones, that I have had a rather insignificant part in preparing this expedition, for all I have furnished, aside from the boat itself, consists of two lots of luxuries that may or may not be needed. And what may they be? asked Dr. Geese, who was standing in the group beside him. Thermos flasks and cigarettes. Cigarettes? exclaimed Beth in horror. The doctor nodded approvingly. Capital, said he. Next to our anodynes and anaesthetics, nothing will prove so comforting to the wounded as cigarettes. They are supplied by nurses in all the hospitals in Europe. How many did you bring? Ten cases of about 25,000 each. A quarter of a million cigarettes, gasped Beth. Too few, asserted the doctor, in a tone of raillery, but we'll make them go as far as possible. And the thermos cases are also valuable. Cool water to parched lips means a glimpse of heaven. Hot coffee will save many from exhaustion. You've done well, my boy. End of chapter 4